Good morning, or good afternoon. So thankful that I can take this time with you to share this message with you. Hopefully you're gathered in your homes and you've already sang songs unto God, teaching, encouraging those that are there with you. Perhaps you'll sing a few songs afterwards. But we're so thankful that you're able to do that and keep in mind it's not only important to read and study God's Word, but to sing, to pray to God. Because remember all those things that the Christians did, uh, the first century Christians did in the New Testament that were told about, gathering together. And of course at this time we're not able to gather in person collectively as a large group, uh, but we do look forward uh, coming June to be able to do such. So we look forward to that day. Now I want to get on with the lesson. I've already recorded this once and had the, recorded the lesson too long. So we're going to try to make this time, this round of preaching the lesson shorter to fit into our time frame. So let's get into what we want to talk about today. The title is Say Something. Say Something. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 20, 16 through 22. And that's where we learn about this woman who speaks up. She says something. We learn and we can see perhaps of how brave and how bold she is, courageous. She's not the only individual that we learn in Scripture that does this. But this month we've been focusing on women of the Bible. And so here is yet another account. We're not told her name, but yet she's to be an example for us, both men and women alike. And what we're going to see as we read a few verses here in chapter 20 is we're going to see that the city this woman is in was going to be destroyed, was under attack. But then uh, she speaks up. She has some wisdom. She's known for her wisdom. The town has residents known for their wisdom, and so she speaks up. And because of her willingness to speak up, the town is spared. And the whole reason the town was going to be under attack was because a man was hiding there. And they hand that man over uh, to the people looking for him. So that's what we're going to notice here. So there's a set stage for this. Let's begin in, in 2 Samuel chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. 1 and 2, it reads this. And there happened to be there a rebel whose name was Sheba, the son of Bekiri, a Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet and said, We have no share in David, nor do we have inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So every man of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba, the son of Bekiri. But the men of Judah from the Jordan, as far as Jerusalem, remained loyal to their king. So here's where we start learning about where the problem is going to come from. That someone betrays King David. And there are those who are following this man, this betrayer. And so David's army, David's um, army is going to dwindle. Those servants of his are going to dwindle. And now he has to be worried about Sheba, uh, of rallying others, of, of taking over cities. And we're going to see that here. But this is where the problem all begins. Where, why we even encounter a, a woman in verse 16 is because of this issue, this problem. So look down at verse 6. It says, And David said to Abishai, Now Sheba, the son of Bekiri, will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he find for himself fortified cities and escape us. So again, David is referring to that betrayer and how he is now out on the run. He's perhaps a free man, but he's, David is worried about this man, that he may do harm uh, to the people that David was supposed to keep watch over, or the man would, would gather a large enough army and attack David. And we know from Scripture that David was a man after God's own heart, Yes, he had his faults, but he was a servant of God, one who would be willing to repent, ask for forgiveness. And, and so this man, being a betrayer of that, could do some real harm. So David wanted to stop this before it got out of hand. What we learn here is that Sheba betrayed David. We see that David wants Sheba stopped before he causes 
more problems. So let's then get into the destruction of the city or, or the city that's underway to being destroyed. It's not yet destroyed, but just on the verge of that. Verses 14 through 15. And he went through all the tribes of Israel to Abel and Beth Mecca and all the Barites. So they were gathered together and also went after Sheba. Then they came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Mecca, and they cast up a siege mound against the city, and it stood by the rampart. And all the people who were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. Again, they had orders from King David to be on the lookout for Abel. They were they're searching for Abel. And whether they had uh, a, a true sense that he was there or just going to look over this town, and perhaps they've done it in other cities as well. But here they were. They're going to disrupt life in this city and perhaps destroy some things in the process. And plus, especially finding out that Sheba was truly there, who knows what harm, what damage they could do. But they must find this betrayer, one who went against the king. So they surrounded the city, and they would have disrupted the life of those in Abel. Think about families, think about people who owning businesses and those type situations. People going about their everyday lives all for it to be disrupted without a notice. So now, while we see perhaps this problem coming for this city, yet we're going to see that this woman speaks up. And really can bring our minds back to the thought of Abigail. We, we talked about Abigail at the first of the month. We talked about how uh, her husband uh, was not kind, was not courteous to David, not hospitable. But yet she also was a woman, perhaps a wise woman. We're told she's of good understanding. And goes to David, brings him food, shows kindness, asks for forgiveness. So what examples we learn from these women in Scripture? But look at verse 16. This is where we learn about this woman. It says, Then a wise woman cried out from the city, Hear, hear, please say to Joab, Come nearby that I may speak with you. When he had come near to her, the woman said, Are you Joab? He answered, I am. Then she said to him, Hear the words of your maidservant. And he answered, I am listening. So she spoke, saying, They used to talk in former times, saying, They shall surely seek guidance at Abel, and so they would in disputes. I am among the peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? Told that she's a wise woman and she's concerned about perhaps herself, perhaps family members, friends, neighbors, those in her community. Verse 20, And Job answered and said, Far be it, far be it from me, that I should swallow up or destroy him. That is not so. But a man from the mounds of Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bekiri, by name, has raised his hand against the king, against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. Again, to understand that, uh, of they weren't truly just seeking after this city and to harm this city. It somehow wasn't that the city had offended King David, but that it just might have to be a casualty, might be in the way uh, of these men finding Sheba. But now there's some communication going on. And now the, the people inside the walls, now the people inside the city are going to be able to help, going to be able to take care of this ish issue. And all because this woman spoke up, because she said something question we can ask ourselves, was it this woman's job to speak with leaders? Now we see that there are women, again, like we talked with Abigail. There are those who go before um, men. Again, perhaps you know the account of Esther, who was queen. And even though as queen, it was still seen uh, perhaps unlawful or unwise for her to go before the king. But yet, she did. So perhaps it wasn't an Perhaps it would have been all right for this woman to have gone before uh, this general, to go before this man and find out what was happening. But it probably wasn't what she ought to have been doing. probably wasn't her job. It was probably someone else's job to take care of. 
but she stepped up and did the right thing. She did what no one else was willing to do. And when you think about this, we can not only relate her to Abigail, but we can relate her to David himself. Think about David and Goliath. When David arrived there and found Goliath, it wasn't that Goliath was surrounded uh, in emptiness, in an empty desert. But no, there were men out there who were armored, who had weapons that could have fought Goliath, that perhaps had more experience than David did. But yet they were fearful, yet they were cowards. They didn't fully put their trust in God. And so even David, with perhaps a lower amount of experience, perhaps David, uh, one who was uh, on the smaller side of things, who the armor did not fit, and yet David was able to overcome Goliath. All because he stepped up to do the right thing. So what lessons we learn from both David and this woman here? A lesson that's meant for both men and women. That when we see something that's wrong, we ought to speak up, we ought to say something. We ought to be willing to do our best to fix it. So here we see this woman speaking up, and what a a great example it is for us. Well, it's great that she spoke up, but is this going to be resolved? Will she find Sheba? The answer is yes. So we'll... We've just read verse 21, but we'll pick back up there, middle of it. It says, So the woman so the woman said to Joab, Watch, his head will be thrown to you over the wall. Then the woman in her wisdom went to all the people, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bekiri, and threw it out to Joab. Then he blew a trumpet, and they withdrew from the city, every man to his tent. So Joab returned to the king at Jerusalem. Think about this. Here was this betrayer, this one they were searching out for. But once they communicated with the people on the inside, and once she then had this information, she could go out and she told other people. She got other people involved. Yes, she's the one who spoke up. Yes, she's the one who said something. But think about it. And ask the question, why would she tell others? Why would she enlist their help if she seems to be so brave and so courageous? Well, these men weren't only coming to attack this woman, but they were going to, again, uh, infiltrate the whole city. So this affected everyone in the city. And it was in their best interest to find this man as soon as possible. And the conflict was resolved and did not get out of hand. Whether that be for the fear that David had against him or for this city, was taken care of. Someone spoke up because someone said something. Because when someone saw the wrong going on, they did the right thing. People asked questions. Perhaps we have stopped asking questions. We've gotten out of uh, it being normal for us to ask questions. And certainly there are things uh, that we probably do take for granted. There are things we don't have to ask questions about. But asking those questions can be very important can it be an understanding for ourselves to help those that are um, around us. So don't be afraid to ask questions. And by this woman doing such, she's able to perhaps spare her city any harm or trouble. So what, a, what an example this woman is for us. As we think about her courage, her bravery, and we think about the phone call this evening at 6 o'clock, I want to encourage you to think of other moments where men and women spoke up. It can be men or women. They spoke up. They said something. They displayed courage. They got involved. Perhaps it it wasn't an anonymous decision, not a decision that everyone was on. Perhaps they were all by themselves in making this decision. But it was the right choice. So be thinking about that. Let's share those examples this evening from the Old Testament, the New Testament, men and women, and talk about these people who we can look up to so that when we're faced with a challenge, we ourselves will be able to speak up. This woman, what we see, she did not allow the problem, the wickedness, to remain in her city. Because if she did, it would have caused more damage. Had she just idly sat by. So that's not my problem. 
Had, had there been those men coming over the wall, had they entered into the city, who knows what would have taken place. But yet, she went searching for that problem and it removed it from the city. Think about you. Whether you are a Christian or, or think about it being a Christian. But do you want sin to be removed from your life? Do you want sin to be removed from your life? We as Christians that have perhaps already answered that question and have already been baptized into Christ realize the dangers of sin. Realizing that it, it doesn't really promise you anything but short enjoyment. It's not really there for you, but is out to get whatever it wants. But yet we can understand the love that God has. Understand that it is far greater than anything that sin can promise us. If you are someone that wants their sin removed from them, then I want to share with you this verse. Perhaps you're skeptical, perhaps you have some questions, but I share with you with you this verse, Psalm 103, verse 12. It tells us that God can remove our sins as far as the east is from the west. Think about that. Whether you're a Christian who, who struggles with that and, well, I, I know that I'm guilty, I still remember it, so how is it that God removes the sin from me? Is it truly gone? Perhaps you're someone who's not yet a Christian, you're asking that question of, is it possible that I've been living in sin for so many years that God can really remove that from me, that I can really change? We're told that God will remove it as far as the east is from the west. And how is that possible? How is sin removed from those that are guilty? It's all because, she, because God sent his son, Jesus, into the world. Because Jesus became a sacrifice for the world, for the guilty, for those who were enemies of God, those who turned their backs on God. Jesus died. So that if we would be willing to leave that behind, put that in our past, repent of it, asking for forgiveness, confessing who Jesus is, that he is the Son of God, that he is the Christ, that we would be willing to be united with him in baptism, we can have our sins washed away. And we can be clean, we can be pure, Unified with God, we can be an example of God's love, forgiveness, His mercy, His justice to those out in the world as we come in contact with them. And we're also given a hope of eternity, everlasting life with our Creator, with our Heavenly Father. What joyous news that is. I'm so thankful you're able to tune into this lesson this morning, this afternoon. So thankful that able to hear a portion of God's word. We are continuing to pray for you. And again, we look forward to the day that we can meet here in person.